Okay, buddy. Section number five. This is the last section of chapter uh, 27. And chapter 27 uh, was composed of or is composed of five sections, while chapter 28, which is going to be also uh, uh, a material for uh, term one, is composed of four sections. Of it. Today, just before I come here to this class, I just posted to the portal the requirement for next week. I mean the weekly plan for next week, 28.1. Directly we're going to start with 28.1. But the first period of next week, inshallah, we're going to um, assign it for a kind of uh, computer or game-based learning. So I have a game, and we can just run it, and we can just divide the, uh, the class into like three groups. So yeah, next week we might have a quiz? No, we don't have a quiz, for sure, because we already did four quizzes. We need some material for the midterms. And I already posted the material for uh, the midterms. So uh, the material for the midterms, if I still remember very well, is going to be this section, 27.5 plus 28.1. Okay, so two sections only. Yeah, I'm not going to make so it. Next week, Unless if you want, I can add more. No, 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 no. If you so want. Next week, one quiz. No quizzes next week. I already wrote this. No quizzes next week. Okay? Because we need some material to be left for the midterm. We yes, don't have enough material. Yes, Mr. What do you mean, sorry? I can't hear. Oh, no. We already did four quizzes. We were supposed to make four quizzes. Mm -hmm. But we have to stop now because we already did four quizzes, right? And we have the, mid the, the midterm in, in a matter of two weeks. So we don't have enough time now. After the midterm, if we have enough time left, we can do quiz number five in case if you want. And the purpose of doing quiz number five is just, you know, to replace one of yeah. the marks if you yeah. didn't do well in the midterm. Okay, guys. Please, all right, let's start. Section five, imperialism in Southeast Asia. We're still talking about the same title, which is imperialism. We started by talking about imperialism in Africa. Then we narrowed down our topic to discuss about a specific case study, which was Nigeria. Then we moved to talk about the Ottoman lands, and then we moved to a little bit to the east to talk about the Indian subcontinent. And now we are moving to the Southeast, and who can tell me what countries are located there in this area, Southeast Asia? Just name a country, I don't know, yeah? India. India? No, we talked about India. We're talking about Southeast Asia. Uh, not a little, no. Yes, other than India, because we already discussed India. Yes, miss? India and Pakistan are like, no, one land. Yes? Philippines, exactly, Philippines. China is far east, actually. It's not south east. It's just far east. Yes, anybody, anybody, please, guys? Anybody? Yes? Nepal? Nepal, part of it. Yeah, okay. What about Indonesia? Indonesia, bravo. Okay, Malaysia, Indonesia. Have you ever heard about a country called Burma? Yes. All right. Before it was called Myanmar. All right. Hello, we're going to talk about it. Uh, as you said, the Philippines. Uh, what about, yeah? Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Thailand, all these countries, all right? So, still the main cause or the main motive, which is the demand for the products. Still, it's more about economy. So demand for Asian products drove Western imperialists to seek position of Southeast Asian lands. Now, there is something common between all the lands or the countries here in this area. We're going to see the map later on. But, let's just do the introduction. The greedy Europeans, remember when we talked about Ottoman land and then we moved to talk about subcontinent, Indian subcontinent? We always say that human beings are greedy in their nature. The more they have, the more they want. Alright? So, it's not enough for Europeans to take over Latin America and North America after the Christopher Columbus discovered the new land. It wasn't enough for them to take over Africa. It wasn't enough for them to take over the Ottoman land. It wasn't even enough to, uh, for them to take the jewel in the crown, the Indian subcontinent. They, they are greedy in their nature. Okay, we're human beings at the end of the day. We're greedy. So they just moved to take the last part of the world, which is Asia or Southeast Asia. Wouldn't they stop in Africa? They would rather continue to other places in the world. And now we're talking here about the southeastern part of Asia, which is called or referred to geographically as the Pacific Rim Yanam. So, what do we mean by Pacific Rim? It has something to do with the Pacific Ocean. So these are the countries that border the Pacific Ocean. What do we mean, what do we mean exactly when we say border the Pacific Ocean? They are in coastal lines that protect They are? 
They're in the In, which means I they are island. islands. Bravo. So, why? What do we need from this country? What did Europeans need from this country? Their strategic location. Strategic location. Along the sea route to China. And remember what I always keep on saying, China and India were the two major trading destinations at that time. What do Europeans need? What did they need actually from China? What a product usually they, they used to trade with in, in China? No. No. From India. What do they need from India? Spices. What do they need from China? The main product in China was? Silk. Exactly. The silk. Exactly. So the silk from China, spices from India. Can you imagine eating the food without spices? Cooking something without spices? Tasteless. You cannot even eat it. So these are the, uh, the countries we're referring to in this area, Pacific Rim. And as you can see, there is something common between them. All of them are islands, except maybe this one is like a peninsula. Now, this is the same area on a bigger scale map. OK? And let's start objective number one. European powers invade the Pacific Rim. Imperialism is an invasion at the end of the day. So, European race to claim Pacific Rim. Race because everybody, not only one European country, most of the strongest European countries at that time rushed to take over this area. The same as they did when they rushed to Africa or for Africa. Lands of Southeast Asia that border the Pacific Rim are formally recognized as the Pacific Rim countries. Dutch, British, French, Germans, all these countries, and remember here I'm talking about the Dutch and not the Deutsch. There is a big difference. Dutch are Holland, Netherlands, Deutsch were Germans. Claim parts of the Pacific Rim. What did they do mainly? They established trading posts. Why trading posts? Because these countries were China. islands. So they have longer coastal areas. So they can consider most of these lands are ports. Okay, harbors. The land there was also perfect for a plantation. Why do you think these lands there are were perfect for plantations? They're tropical. Tropical, exactly, due to the strategic location. Tropical, they receive, you know that tropical countries receive lots of rainfall in summer. And this is why when you go to these areas, you find different types of fruits. We don't have these fruits here, for example, the papaya. We don't have any. Or? A dragon fruit, they call it. Ah, must be. Banana? Feed banana, but different type of banana. That's the same as banana we have here. Okay, still, it's the same as there was like other type. Where, where does most of the banana come from? Philippines. Philippines, exactly. Or Ecuador sometimes. So, and still, it's like, you know, um, tropical. All right? Now, we're going to study about three examples of the three major superpowers, European superpowers. The area they took in Southeast Asia and their effect. How did they influence these areas? So we're going to start with the Dutch. The Dutch, I mean the people from Netherlands, they took over uh, Indonesia. What is today Indonesia? And Indonesia is the, day that, is the country that has the um, uh, highest number of Muslim population in the world, mm. around 250 uh, million. And they uh, took over Indonesia in which form of control? Economic imperialism. Why? Because they controlled the country through a company. And they called the company Dutch East Indies. Guys, what does it mean East Indies? Do we have a West Indies in order to call something else East Indies? They, what do we mean by East Indies? We studied before like in India, uh, in Indian subcontinent, the British also established British East Indies, right? So, yes, Minna. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, I can't hear. Because of their education, to the east. Yeah. Yes, but is there a West Indies to call the thing that is located to the east East Indies? Because when you say East Indies, it means that there's something also called West Indies. And to differentiate between them, you have just to give it another name, East Indies, based on the location. Yes, miss. When Christopher Columbus reached America, they thought that. Exactly. When Christopher Columbus decided to travel to the west, he didn't know that there is a land there. His intention was to find a shortcut to India, Indies in Spanish language. 
remember that all the people who live there in the Bahamas, in the Barbados, in the like old Latin America were colonized by Spain. So they speak Spanish. So Indies is the title for India. And because they traveled to the west to find a shortcut to India and they didn't find India, they found another land. So they just you know, wanted to differentiate between the people who were living there and the people who were living in the original India located in the east. And this is why the native people of Latin America and North America were given the title Red Indians. What Indians? I mean, they are not Indians. They were not Indians, right? right? They were Latin Americans. And this is why, historically, it's really wrong to give them this name, Net, uh, uh, Indians. We have to call them native people of, of America. We don't have to use the term uh, Indians, because they were not Indians. This is the title that was given to them by those who thought that they are going to India. So, guys, what did the Dutch do in Indonesia? They settled in Indonesia as their homeland. And when you settle in a place as a homeland, then you have to build in this homeland. Because you cannot live in your homeland without schools, without hospitals, without roads, without, 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 right? When you consider this place as not your land, as a kind of just a place that I invaded, so you were not going to take care of the place. But when you consider it as its home, your land, homeland, then your people are going to move, to move to this land, and your people need to ensure that they are still enjoying the same standard of living they have it back in Europe, in Holland in this case. So this is why they started to affect and influence in this place. So different from the British who lived in India but retired back at home, which means that this is the direct and the indirect methods of management we studied about in section two. The Dutch established a rigid social class system, caste system, remember the caste system. This caste system was based on this triangle. Oh my God, thank you. Chemistry teachers, some physics teachers, some math teachers. We're always suffering from the scientific topics, guys. Okay. Too much writing, exactly. You keep on writing, I guess, right? Okay, guys. The Dutch established a kind of caste system where, for sure, Europeans, the Dutch. The white race, remember social Darwinism, should come on the top, right? Mm -hmm. So the Dutch were there. Who comes next? Educated Indonesians. Wealthy and educated Indonesians. So they go next, mm -hmm. two, one. And number three? Plantation workers. Plantation workers or peasants. Now, the Dutch also fought farmers to specify one over five of their land to export crops. What do we mean by export crops? Exactly, who said cash crops? Yeah, exactly, cash crops. Which is little bit better than the French or other people who used to turn all the land into cash crops. At the end of the day, they wanted to make a profit. You cannot invade a country. For nothing, you have to make a profit out of invading a country. But still, they kept part of the land, the plantations, to food crops, so that people will not suffer from a famine or starvation. Okay. Yes, miss. But these were the classes of the society at the time. Like so you cannot create like a, like a class in between. There were only three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Indonesia, they were like three only. Now, in Europe, it was different. In India, it was even different. Like, remember the four varnas. It depends on society. Okay? It's, di it's different from a society to another society. Yes, Miss Karen? Uh, so, the Dutch made the uh, crops, cash crops, 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 crops? Made one over five of the plantations, uh, I mean the lands, uh, devoted for uh, cash crops. All right, let's go for another example. The British and the area they took and the effect they did on the coast. Competing with the Dutch, Britain seized Singapore as a port and a trading base between their ships that traveled to India and China. Why? Again, because of the strategic location of Singapore between the two major trading destinations at that time, India and China. 
They made a very big harbor in Singapore. The opening later on of the Suez Canal has increased the demand for the raw material from the Pacific Rim, made Singapore one of the busiest uh, harbors in the world at that time. It is the same as Dubai, for example, nowadays. Let's just connect what we are studying in the past to the present time. Dubai nowadays, especially the airports of Dubai, is an international hub that connects most of the world. Let me tell you something. Dubai is located in the Middle East, and it's called Middle East because nearly it's in the middle of the world, right? How many times, I guess, it happened with you when you go to travel and you see lots of people sleeping in the airports, especially in Dubai airport, right? Why? Those are transit, they call them transit passengers. Those who are not coming to Dubai, actually they are going from somewhere to somewhere else, but Dubai is the mid station, it's a kind of mid strategic location so that it connects uh, the, the, like, I mean, the two sides of the world, the east and the west. So, Singapore was playing this role at that time, and the opening of the Suez Canal made it easier, actually, and made this uh, uh, harbor in Singapore one of the busiest at that time. Now, remember the location of England to the west, and Suez Canal is in the middle, and then you are going to the east, far east, China and India, so you need some, like a station in the, in the, in the middle, and Singapore was considered as a station. Okay, your order? You got 15 out of 15 years. Perfect. Well, I don't know if you were cheating or not. Sweet, yeah, exactly. So she wasn't confident about her mind. It means that you were cheating. No. You cheated from uh, now? No, I was from the study. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I Yeah, 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 no doubt. <laughs> okay, guys. Now, also, remember that we talked before about the British Empire was the largest in the history, right? So they did not take only one small country like Singapore. They also extended their authority over another country, which was Malaysia and Burma. Do we have a country called Burma today? No. no. The country that was called Burma today is called nowadays Myanmar or Myanmar sometimes. So there is no more Burma. And I guess you've heard, did you hear the news about Burma? What is really going on nowadays in Burma? What is the issue of today? The reasons are being killed. Whose? Yeah, exactly. The, the issue of racism against the Muslim minority in Myanmar. So, the British affected the demographic status in Malaysia. It was very... I'm not going to write it. Okay. It was very important uh, uh, negative influence, let me, let me say, in Malaysia. As we said, the, the Dutch did an effort in terms of the social society, let me say, when they did their class system. But here, the effect was basically on the demographic stage. Why? Because Malaysia is in the midway to China. And China is the most populous country in the world. Malaysia has lots of, like let me say, job opportunities. The British wanted people to come to work in the mines and also to have the rubbers and uh, like lots of resources in, in Malaysia. So they needed more workers. The Malayans were not allowed in there uh, in, in terms of number of population. So they started to encourage Chinese to come and work in Malaysia. This demographic change resulted in the locals in Malaysia became minority. So the number of Chinese immigrants by the time became even more than the number of the local people. It is the same as here, guys. Who are more in number? The Indian workers here in UAE or the locals? Indian. The locals actually are only 12 to 14 percent, maximum I guess 14. With the Arabs together, the locals and the Arabs were like 20, 20 percent. Mm -hmm. Indians alone are like 50 or 60. 60. 80 baht. No, 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 like 50 or 60, because they're like, like Pakistanis, Filipinos, yeah, exactly. But it's not Filipinos, it's not No, no way, no, no, no. no. <laughs> so, this, actually, there is like this joke, actually, they say that once uh, there was a bomb in India yeah. and nobody died. <laughs> because all the Indians are here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they are doing well, to be honest, they are doing well. Yeah, without them, I can't imagine actually the GCC countries without the Indians. They are the graphic force in the society. They, they do everything. So, everything, just imagine. Can you imagine life without Indians in GCC countries, guys? Who's going to make karak for us? Parata, Jibril, Chips, Amanda, Oh, well, 
So, okay, guys. All right, no. So they became the minority in their own country. The things that created and still problems based on the ethnic or ethnic uh, ethnicities or ethnic groups. Because again, they like, kept their loyalty to their own country, and still nowadays they are like Malayan uh, nationals. The, the third and the last example is about France and the area they took. France took an area that was referred to as the French Indochina. Huh? Why Indochina? Indians, Chinese. Indian. Because it's between India and China. And again, and for the like, one in southern times, the two major trading destinations at that time. These countries are today, or this area was representing these countries, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Cambodia. Now, guys, the French focused on rice. rice exports. So they made like four times as much uh, land was devoted to rice plantations. This has angered the Vietnamese because what is left for them if more than like four times of the land is going to be devoted for rice plantation? What about the other food uh, crops? What is left for them for feeding their children? Now, uh, little. Colonial impact. Guys, remember that I always say that this is uh, an American curriculum yeah. and this is an American book and it's really good for them, for the Westerns, to focus on the positive side of, uh, of imperialism. But again, out of honesty, because I'm, I have to be neutral, because, but, but, but I, as a teacher I have to say that the, 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 the fact, the truth, I cannot teach you something wrong. Uh, imperialism is negative, totally negative. You can't, you can't do something negative and justify it by saying that okay, I'm doing this negative in order to, like you know, to affect the people positively. At the end of the day, this is wrong. You can't steal the money of people to say, well, I'm, I'm collecting money to build the mosque or a church, because at the end of the day, you are stealing their own people, uh, their own money. So. Modernization, they focus on building uh, like new businesses, modernizing uh, uh, these countries, improving the health, sanitation, uh, education, whatever. They are like, look at this, millions migrated to Southeast Asia to work. So they are like trying to project what has happened as a kind of, they were good, they were like, you know, they were like, you know, making job opportunities for people. That should be cash crops, yeah. Cash crops, yeah, for example, you have a land, you can, the land is very fertile, you can cultivate it by food crops, things that can be edible, yeah. and cash crops, things that can be planted to sell, like the cotton, for example. You can make money out of it, okay? Really? Yeah. How can they make a profit? But the, no, no, maybe that was a project for like a specific period of time. But at the end of the day, China is the most populous country in the world. With 1.7 billion, they are ready to smile to get food for you. I'm, I'm sure. So you are going to lose in this case. Love, I don't think so. Yes, miss? Sorry, I can't, I can't hear. Is it still powerful as You mean powerful what? Economically, politically, military, what? Not the same as before, because the United States now is no, and Russia for sure. But why? You know why? Why they lost some of their power? Because of World War II, World War II, World War II. Because they were fighting against. Guys, guys, I can't hear your friend. What is it, sorry? Someone used to take permission from the Queen of England to do something in their own country. One of the British colonies. Still have to Canada. Canada. Yeah, Canada. Not, not take a permission. I say that Canada is part, for example, of an, a, a voluntary organization called Commonwealth. It means that we show the tribute to the country that was like colonizing us before, or the country that was like considered as the mother country. And this is why we speak the same language. But it doesn't mean that if they want to do something, they have to take a permission. Politically speaking, the Queen of England nowadays has no authority or power over any of the countries that were yeah, colonized before. That. It's a kind of honorary position. When the Queen of England, for example, pay a visit to Canada or to Australia, she sits actually in the presidential chair, but with no political uh, effect. She cannot take a decision, for example, within Canada or within Australia. It's just a political, uh, political show. Yeah, yeah. So guys. 
as you can see here, the last thing they mentioned is the negative impact. As if there was more positive than negatives. Okay. Did I show you that one, uh, the photo for the slave trade, the thing that you studied about last year in, in a, an American book? Did I show it to you? No. Let me just show you something, guys. And this is something that was actually found and discovered by um, an American uh, young lady. She was teaching her son in grade nine. And in his history book, I show you too. Uh, listen, I guess it's here. See here, for example, yeah, yeah, I guess it's in this file. Wait, 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 guys. Yeah, this one. I guess you studied last year in grade 11, you studied about the slave trade, right? Yeah. And no doubt that it was kind of a crime in, in, in the history of humanity. See here, referring to the slave trade that has happened between the 15 and 1800, it brought millions of workers. And the lady was making fun of this, I mean, we were, we was real hard workers, was it we? And then she said, uh, millions of workers, not that announced, okay, workers apply wages. Uh, yeah. So it's a kind of, okay, we were doing a favor for the Africans by like, giving them job opportunities in America. So uh, this is why, guys, if you still remember in the beginning of the year, I, um, I spent like a whole week telling you, uh, explaining to you that how history is projected by different people from different backgrounds based on their backgrounds. So history is just the interpretation of different historians. Okay, based on your background, you might, just, you might just project history in your own way, which might be totally opposite to what somebody else from another background might project. Okay, so again, you have to be critical thinker and not only thinkers when you study history. Okay, so let's move to objective number two, I guess. Yeah, and we're going to stop here, inshallah, today. Okay, guys, modernization, modernization in Siam. Do we have a country called Siam? No. What is Siam? What? Who said Thailand? How did you know? Uh, where, where is it? Oh, okay. Uh, I thought you were smart enough, guys. Okay, good one. Okay, good. I, I'll just remove it later on. Okay, perfect. Okay. They changed the name. It's not Siam anymore. It's Thailand nowadays. Okay. Yeah, it's my country. The name. So modernization in Siam. Remember when we studied about imperialism in Africa, we said that there were two countries left in the middle, right? Ethiopia and Liberia. And we talked about the reasons why were they kept uh, in the middle. Another country in this area, the Pacific Rim, was also kept intentionally independent, which was. Siam or Thailand for a reason. Actually more than one reason, but the main reason was it was located between the French controlled areas and the British controlled areas. Remember when we talked about a country or an area that separates two conflicts? We call it buffer zone. Exactly. Now to avoid any kind of possible clash between the British and the French. They just agreed, both of them, to keep it in the middle. Besides, also the Thais had a good king. The same as King Menelik II in Ethiopia, who also modernized his country. So King Mongot here modernized his country in the sense that he started schools, he reformed the legal systems, he reorganized the government, he just made uh, improved transportation, made telegraphs, okay, that connects uh, improved communication, and he ended slavery in his country. So his country was kept independent and it wasn't imperialized. We're going to stop here, and this is um, objective.